I call this, I title this sermon, The Weakness of the Flesh. We're going to talk about patience and power and purpose after we go to the Lord once again in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we have read from Your Word, it is powerful. Your Word speaks to us in ways that well, the unsaved person cannot understand. It speaks to our heart and it guides and directs us. This morning, I know that some people might think this is an unusual portion of Scripture to be preaching from. And yet, as we go through this marvelous Gospel of Mark, it fits right along. There's important things there for us to see. And I ask, Lord, that you would give me the wisdom to be able to articulate it understandably for everyone. And I pray that hearts would be open and ears, our spiritual ears especially, open and listen to the Word. And I know that you'll have your way in every heart here this morning. For there are many needs, there are many hurts, there are many wants. And Father, I pray that our folks are now focusing on you, not on the things of the world, not on those cares and concerns, and not what they're going to do this afternoon, but what you are speaking to them right now. So Father, I pray that you would have your way in this hour, that you would take charge. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, we finished last week and we told you they left, uh, Jesus led his disciples out of the upper room from that Passover meal, what we call now the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table. They went over to Gethsemane and he told his disciples, sit here while I shall pray. Well, the Bible tells us then that Jesus took his inner circle, Peter, James, and John with him and went a little farther. Peter, James, and John had seen a lot of things that the other disciples didn't see. One of the things they saw, of course, was a transfiguration, but now they're going to see something else. And he takes them to a, a point there and tells them also to sit and relax, basically. And as we read this portion of Scripture, it appears that everything is very peaceful. It's quiet in the garden. But this is only the calm before the storm. There is a huge storm that's brewing just to the outskirts of the garden now. But why do I say at that point that everything is calm and peaceful? You know, Jesus is, he understands what's going on. He's known from eternity past. But everything is calm. Why are the disciples so calm at this time? Because they're following Jesus. Jesus left the upper room and said, follow me. We're going to Gethsemane. They followed him. He tells them to sit here. They sit. They're following Jesus. And when we follow Jesus, we're at peace. The time that we're not at peace is when we don't follow Jesus. You know, before we were saved, we weren't at peace with God. You have to come to Jesus Christ to have that peace. But now these fellows are following Jesus. And the disciples have willingly followed the Lord. They're in Gethsemane now, a place that they're familiar with. And the Lord gave them the direction. Sit ye here while I shall pray. Here is the long and short of the matter. Jesus tells his disciples to wait for him. Fellow, you sit right here. You watch, you wait, you sit here. You don't go off on your own. Don't try to get ahead of me. Don't you go get ahead of Jesus. Wait. There's a plan, there's a purpose, there's a time you wait. See, this is a lesson for every born-again believer in Jesus Christ. We have to learn this. First, we must be patient and wait upon the Lord. That's a hard thing for us to do. Man is, un, is not a very patient person. We're not, we're not patient people, are we? You know, think about the words of the apostle he wrote, Paul as he wrote to Thessalonian believers over 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. For they themselves show what us what manner of entering we, are, we had, in, had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom he raised for the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Patience to wait. See, Paul was talking about believers then and believers today. Wait. Wait for what? Well, you go over to Titus 2.13. He tells us, 
we are to be looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Wait and look for the rapture. Anticipate it. He told the disciples that night, you wait. Wait for me. Don't get ahead of me. We are to wait too, patiently. But looking patiently and anticipating his return at any moment is one thing. But I'll mention a little bit, that doesn't mean you don't have something to do while you wait. The disciples had something they needed to do that night too. Jesus went ahead and said, well, I shall pray. What should the disciples be doing while they're waiting? They should be praying. As we wait for the Lord from heaven, we should be praying. As he comes back to the church, we should be praying. We should be getting out the gospel. Second, Jesus told his disciples to wait patiently, but he does not mean for them to do nothing. You know, you can sit on your hands. So many people, once they become believers, and that excitement wires off, you know, that new believer, he's on fire. Well, boy, if you had 10 new believers in this church, we could fill the pews. New believers get out there and they pull people. They drag people. They witness to people. But, you know, that flame starts to flicker. And eventually, a lot of those people say, well, you know, I'm saved. I don't have anything else to do. I'll just wait on the Lord. That's not what you do. It's like the story of the little children in a Christian school. The teacher was telling them about the rapture and how the Lord's going to come for them one day. And anticipate. they ran to the window to look out. They're looking for the Lord. If you're looking for the Lord, you've got to work for Him. Yes, you wait for Him, but you work for Him. You see, we are to follow the example of Jesus. We're called Christians. Christian means what? A follower of Christ. The Lord says He is going to pray. If we're a follower of Christ, what do we do? We are to pray. That's what we are to do. If Jesus Christ felt the need and desire to pray, and if Jesus Christ prayed, then we should be praying as we wait, shouldn't we? If the Son of God needed to talk to the Father, don't we too need to do that also? One of the most neglected things uh, next to attending church services that Christians don't do is pray. They neglect the great opportunity of coming boldly before the throne of grace and making their petitions known. Yes, we're to be waiting for the rapture of the church, but that doesn't mean that we're not to be working for the Lord. There's a whole world out there of people who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only way for us to know the work that God has for us to do is to do go to the Lord in prayer. Ask, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then wait patiently for Him to answer. Don't pray and say, Lord, what do you want me to do when I already have in your mind what you want to do and go do it? Wait. That's what He's telling them. Wait. If you notice, Jesus told them to wait, but He didn't tell them to sleep. You see, when you wait on the Lord, you have to be patient. And it's hard not for us to go to sleep. It's difficult to have patience because we have a desire to move on without giving the situation a great deal of thought. You know, a lot of things we do in this life, we never ask the Lord. You have a desire for us. All of a sudden you have a desire, I want a new car. So you go buy a new car. And then you find out you don't have enough money to make the payments. Why didn't you ask the Lord first? You say, should I ask the Lord about buying a car? Yes. Should I ask the Lord about going here or that? Yes. And wait. So often we just rush into things. And then once we do, we say, well, the Lord told me to do this. So the Lord showed me to do that. Did he? You have to be honest with yourself. Did he really tell me to do that? You know, he's not going to, you're not going to hear a voice when you look in the mirror and say, go and do. It's not going to happen. You have to wait for that still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Most of the time when we say, well, the Lord told me to do this, it's something we wanted to do and it was not in the will of the Lord and we fail and it was because of our own selfish desires. Wait on the Lord. Fourthly, sitting and waiting for the Lord does not mean sleep again. Don't, you know, we don't have to sleep. Now understand that we need sleep and the older I get, the more sleep I need. I'll tell you, when they turn the time back, it'll throw me off again. But we, I sleep more now, like when I was a kid. But we're not to be sleeping when there is something that the Lord wants us to do. But what did Jesus truly want His disciples to do? He wanted them to follow His example. He wanted them to wait, follow Him. He wanted them to pray 
pray specifically for strength to resist the temptation and fear that was coming. Jesus already warned them what's coming, especially Peter. There's going to be a great deal of temptation, a great amount of fear that's going to come into their lives in just a, just a moment coming to them. Not only on that particular night, but the following days. You know, we see them on the, the night of resurrection. They're in the upper room and behind locked doors. Why? Fear. They needed the help of the Lord to fight off that temptation and to aid them in overcoming their fears. They're human. When they see the Lord arrested, when they see Him condemned, and they see Him nailed to that cross, they're going to be afraid. Why? Because they could be next. They're human. And the, the most important person in your life, be honest, is you. I don't want it to happen to me. And there's fear, so they run. That's why when the Lord taught His disciples to pray, you know, we call it the Lord's Prayer. I call it the Disciples' Prayer because He was teaching them to pray. Lead us not into temptation. Very simple words, aren't they? But that's what they needed to remember that night. Lord, lead us not into temptation because temptation's coming. They also need to be praying for the courage to stand up because there was going to be a strong need for courage that night and for the next days and for that matter for the rest of their lives. There are going to be armed soldiers coming that night along with powerful men with evil intentions who are going to lead Jesus from the garden that night. They would need courage to stand up against that. They would need courage not to run. Jesus already told them they're going to run. They're going to flee. Yeah, those evil men are coming. Again, in the disciples' prayer, deliver us from evil. These are the things they should have been praying for. Would it have changed things? Had they prayed. They needed to be praying for guidance and direction. The only, way we, the only possible way that we can know which road to take is to look at a map. I know that's old-fashioned. People today use GPS, but you look at a map. And in prayer, we are given the right and proper direction of which road to take. The Bible and prayer are our maps. So Jesus, after he had gone a little bit further with Peter, James, and John, told them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Okay. Now, you enter circle, you stay here and you watch. Tarry here. Watch. But watch what? What are they to be watching for? They're in a peaceful garden. They have their eight friends a little ways off. Jesus is just a little ways ahead of them. Most people think that they're to keep watch for those religious leaders and soldiers who are coming to arrest Jesus. I don't think so. See, that hour was set. It was unchangeable. The Lord had known that from eternity past, the exact second they would come. The coming of those evil men was not what Jesus wanted those three men to be watching for. They were to watch the example that Jesus set for them. Watch. Watch what I do. There's something we need to understand, and that is the Garden of Gethsemane was a very familiar spot to Jesus and his disciples. It's a place where Jesus frequently brought his disciples. And since they came to Gethsemane often like that, Judas was well aware of where it was, where they would be. So Judas knew where to find Jesus that night. Once again, there's something else here. Jesus, again, never, never spent a night in the city of Jerusalem this week. You understand? He always goes outside the city. On this most important night, our Lord once again went out of the city of Jerusalem, out into the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, Jesus' purpose in going up to the garden was to pray. Prayer is so important and it's so neglected by Christians. We have, why don't we have? We have not because we ask not, right? So the Bible says, why am I afraid? I didn't ask the Lord's strength. Why am I running? I didn't ask the Lord. Why, why, do I have these, why don't I have this? Why don't, you don't ask. Now, I mean, you can pray for a million dollars. That doesn't mean God's going to give you a million dollars. That's not in His will. But if you ask Him for courage and strength and wisdom to do His work, 
you're going to get it. Why don't we have it? We don't have it. We don't ask. And the language of Scripture indicates that Jesus faced a severe ordeal in the garden. We're told, when we're told the words began to be amazed, and he's startled, it's intense. That's the look on Jesus' face. He has come to the hour. Over those years of his ministry, the hour's not yet come. Now it's here. And since he was very heavy, that is, he's distressed. That breaks my heart when I think about Jesus being distressed. He's not distressed. Or he's distressed over us. All those people out there are never going to accept the gospel. But his distress is not because of the physical pain of the cross. I've had people say, well, he's distressed. He's afraid to go to the cross. To no, he's not. He was not worried about it. The cross is terrible beyond belief. We can't even comprehend the pain there. We can't comprehend everything Jesus is going through. The crown of thorns, the, the lashing of the back, all those things. But Jesus was facing something that we cannot understand. He was facing the travail of His soul. Far greater than the suffering of His body on the cross. Did Jesus once again face the tempter in the garden as he did in the wilderness? I think he did. I have no doubt that old Satan was right there and he is doing his utmost to pull Jesus in the wrong direction. As he always does. You see, Satan never gives up. He's amazing, isn't he? He never gives up. He knows his, Satan, his fate is sealed, but he doesn't believe it. Why didn't he believe it? He didn't believe the Word of God. I believe the Word of God. I know where He's going to be in eternity from now, but He's intent on destroying anything of God's work. There's one thing for certain, though, as we look at this passage. You and I can stand on the outskirts of the garden and we can look in. All right? We can see by Scripture what's going on. We get a peek of these things. There's mysteries going on there in that garden. that we'll, we'll, We can't understand this out of glory. But I hear many, far too many Peters out there, just like old Peter, they'll sing, I'll go with him through the garden. Well, you know what? You can't do it. I can't do it. I can't go through the garden with him. Can you? Be honest. Could you go to the garden? There's no way that we can understand what Jesus is going through that night. We can't feel the anguish of Jesus' soul. Well, I can understand. No, you can't. We can understand the physical pain. That's a fact. But we cannot even come close to understanding the spiritual anguish of the Lord. Jesus, even though He is totally God, He knows all things. He knows about the feeling of sin on you and me. But He knows nothing about the feeling of sin upon Himself. Jesus knew no sin. Completely sinless. You know, it's like talking about eternity. How long is eternity? We can't imagine. What is being sinless like? We can talk about it, but we have no idea. There's no one around here who's ever been sinless. You know, sin entered the world by the disobedience of one man. You see, Jesus knows the consequences at this point of sin, and the wages of sin is death. Jesus knew no sin. But He had to become sin for us. He had to take our sins upon Himself. And this was the cause of His anguish at night. Think about it. He never knew sin. What did sin do for us? When Adam fell, what happened? We were separated from God. We had no peace with God. Let's go to the cross for a moment. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because the sins of the world were coming on Jesus Christ. And for the first and only time in eternity, He is separated from the Father. It's an anguish that He was not looking forward to. It was something He knew nothing about. Sin. Now, if you want me to lead you through the garden, I'm sorry. I'm going to beg off. I can't do it. Why? Because I, I know and understand all about sin. See, I am a sinner. 
I was born in sin. Sin, sin nature, it separated me from God until I came to Jesus for salvation. And because I'm a sinner, there's absolutely no way that I can go with Him through the garden. Because I already know what it's like to be a sinner. I already know what it likes to have, feel like to have sin in me. I'm so weak, I would just stumble all the way along. You know, you may not understand just how weak I really am. And this is why I can't go through the garden with Him, but what I can do is stand on the edge and wait and pray. Just like the inner circle. You watch me and pray. You watch because you can't go through what I'm going to go through. Jesus asked us to watch and pray so that we do not enter temptation. And the Bible said that Jesus went a little bit further and He fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass Him. Mark records these words of Jesus' prayer. Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. All things are possible unto thee. Could Jesus have just said, I've had enough? And yeah, he's God. But he loves us that much that he wasn't going to let that happen. God loved us before we even created us and had a plan of salvation. Mark says Jesus prayed that the hour might pass him by. Now let me make this clear. Once again, it was not death, physical death that Jesus dreaded. The dread of the moment when He was on that old rugged cross was when the sins of the world would come upon Him. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul writes, For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That's amazing, isn't it? Listen to the, writers of, the writer of Hebrews here in Hebrews. 5, 7, and following. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet he learned, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. He was going to that cross for us. When the Lord finished that prayer, he returns over to Peter, James, and John. Are they watching? They're sleeping. Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. The three right here, these, the inner circle, the ones who have been with Jesus through so much, they remind me of teenagers right here. Not that they're being disobedient, not, but just like teenagers, they're hard to wake up, hard to get them out of bed, they go right back to sleep. Time to go to church, back to sleep they go. It appears that they were able to sleep through it all. The guards are coming to arrest Jesus. Jesus is praying for them, and they can sleep through it all. Even Peter could continue to sleep, even though the Lord had told him this very night, you're going to deny you even know me three times. Peter should have been watching. Peter should have been in prayer. But he just went off to sleep. It's the same for us today. We're to be watching and praying to avoid temptation. But we do too much sleeping. You know, I'll tell you right out. You ever have trouble sleeping? Just pray yourself to sleep. You can pray. You say, get to bed now. Just pray. You fall asleep. You might wake up a little few hours. I pick a prayer about keep going. They should have been praying that night. But see, there's a great deal of daydreaming which goes on today, which in a sense is sleeping because it takes your focus off of Christ. When you fall asleep, your focus is off Christ. When you daydream, your focus is off Christ. And I know it's difficult to sit and listen to somebody talk for a half hour, 45 minutes. I guarantee you that someone is daydreaming right this moment. Wake up! Come out of the daydream! It's kind of like being in, 
back in elementary school, I spent more time daydreaming in elementary school than I did listening to the teacher. That's why I'm so dumb today. But daydreaming happens. We spend far too much time involved in the things of the world rather than watching and spending time in prayer. We need to wake up. We need to focus on the Lord. So Jesus returned back to the place where He had been. And verse 39 says, And again He went away and prayed the, and spake the same words. I've had so many people tell me, well, you don't pray again for the same thing a second time. One time is enough. Well, if Jesus prayed the same thing, can't we pray the same thing? If you're praying for the salvation of someone, and you pray today, Lord, bring so-and-so to salvation. They don't come to salvation tomorrow. Are you going to quit praying for them? No. That prayer might not be answered for 20 years. But you keep praying. You pray in the will of the Father and you pray believing. So many times our prayers aren't answered because we don't believe. Well, the Lord, I, I, I'm praying that He'll be saved and the Lord can't save that fellow. Yes, He can. Pray. And you can pray again and again. You should you know, pray. Give it to the Lord. So, well, give it to the Lord let it go. Yes, you give problems to the Lord. But that doesn't mean you can't ask for the same things again. Lord, be with this person. Help this person. Heal this person. Well, once again, we're followers of Jesus Christ. That's why we're called Christians. If Jesus prayed the same thing, why would it be wrong for us? to pray again and again for the same thing. When you pray for salvation of someone, you're praying in the will of the Lord. A lot of times we, we pray for someone to recover from an illness, and they don't. But God had a plan and a purpose in that. We just have to trust the Lord and keep praying for the next person. But pray for the salvation. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to be saved, but His will is that they will. We pray for them. So if you pray for someone to be saved today and they're not saved right away, don't quit praying for that person. Keep praying. Lift up that request, believing in God time and time and time again. Pray without ceasing, the Bible tells us. So Jesus continues to pray. The disciples continue to sleep. Oh, how often do we fall asleep when we should be watching and praying and waiting on the Lord? We sleep during Bible studies and we sleep during sermons. When I say sleep, I'm not necessarily talking about physical sleep, but over the years I've heard some pretty heavy breathing that comes very close to snoring. But it includes daydreaming, Focusing on something you want to do after service and taking your focus off the Lord. Whenever we take our focus off Jesus, then we are going to fall into temptation. When Peter that night said, Lord, you call me to walk out on the water with you. Come. When he kept his focus on Jesus, he walked on the water. When did he fall? When he looked at the waves all around him, he took his eyes off Jesus, his focus off Jesus, he fell, he sunk. Save me, Jesus, and he saved you. You see, when we let the world dictate our thinking, when we focus on the world, we're going to fail. We're going to fall. Those waves of the world are going to be all around us, and we will begin to sink. That's why we need to focus squarely on Jesus. The disciples had been warned by Jesus that they were going to run away that night. Peter was told he was going to deny him three times. But you know what? We too are capable of the very same thing. Every Christian sitting in this room today is capable of doing the same thing. We can deny Jesus and we can run away. Now, it's so easy to do what is not right when we sleep rather than when we watch, wait, and pray. We can be weak Christians. When we fall back into the things of the world, we can so easily be drawn into sin and our witness is damaged. And when our witness is damaged, the cause of Christ is damaged. 
You never know how much damage is caused. When you live like the world, when you start doing things that you did before you were saved, you are damaging the cause of Christ because the unbelievers are looking at you and saying, that's a Christian? The only thing to do with that. So you know, if you're not witnessing for the Lord, you're witnessing on the other side, aren't you? You fall right back into the things of the world. And when our witness is damaged, the cause of Christ is damaged, and your ability to reach the lost is weakened, actually it's destroyed. The lost don't want to see someone just like themselves. They want to see Jesus in you. Stay awake. Watch. Pray. But sadly, we're just like the disciples on that night. Jesus returned a third time and found them asleep. They had no explanation for their failures. They're human. You know? And being human, we clearly learn one thing from them. You can't trust the flesh. You can't do it. The flesh is weak. The flesh wants to do things. The Holy Spirit says, pull back in. And Jesus told them, though, at this point, sleep on now and take your rest. We do need rest. We need sleep. And that's important at the right time. But there is a time of sleep and there's a time to serve the Lord. There's a time to rest and there's a time to work. And it's time to be born and a time to die, right? In this case, the disciples should have said, should have been praying. But their sleep was also important. I have a feeling they were going to need that rest. The sleep they're getting in the garden may be the last sleep they get for a few days. Because there's going to be a lot of trouble around them, a lot of worry, a lot of concern. I say this because, you know, when we're like that. When our minds are racing with the events that, that cause us pain or trouble or worries or sleep becomes difficult, doesn't it? You lose a family member, someone you love. It's hard to sleep, isn't it? Your mind just will not relax. Sometimes you, your mind goes so fast you can't, you can't even articulate your prayers. Praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit who makes intercession for us there too. But when we're, we're afraid, sleep flees from us. And we get weak. Spiritually weak. And then even when we can fall asleep, drift off for a few minutes, our dreams, have you ever noticed your dreams turn back to the events of that day and grab you? It's like Saturday night. Boy, Satan will work on you on Saturday night. He'll try to keep you from sleeping. He'll try to get you up 20 times a night. He has a purpose because he doesn't want you in these pews on Sunday morning. He wants you to, to sleep when you shouldn't sleep. He wants you to stay awake when you shouldn't be awake. So you're tired. You don't feel rested. And when you're tired, it's difficult to concentrate on the things you should be concentrating on. Yes, the devil works on Saturday night. Boy, he works hard on me on Saturday nights, Sunday mornings. What he is doing, though, the old serpent twofold. First, he's trying to keep you tired enough that you'll stay at home, stay in bed, and not attend church. You see, he understands something that a lot of Christians don't understand. The longer you stay out of church, the harder it is to come back. Oh boy, I've got two hours or so free on Sunday morning. It's so nice. I like it. And it becomes so much more difficult to come back. The devil knows that. And second, if, he, if you do get up and go to church, the devil hopes that lack of sleep that he gave you will keep you from receiving the message. Not giving your complete attention to the studies that are going on. You cannot concentrate and you, and you miss the meaning of the message. But the, revol the result in both cases is exactly the same. You're not going to get fed by the Word of God. <coughs> and that's what Satan wants. In that case, you know what? The devil wins and you lose. We need the strength that comes from the Word of God. How can we have the rest that we really truly need? Jesus says, 
Take your rest. How do we get that rest? Well, over in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's the only place in this world you're going to find rest. It's in Jesus Christ. No matter how hard you work, you will never find true rest without Jesus. You can work from dawn to dust and go to bed and sleep, but you will not have rest. To truly get a, a good rest, you have to have peace in your life. Paul, when he's closing, 2 Thessalonians says this, Now the Lord of peace Himself give you peace always by all means. There's no way else you can get it. Peace means to be at one with God, by the way. Peace, one with God. Isn't that nice? What a nice thought. To be with God. You want to rest, be with God. Peace and rest come only from one person, Jesus Christ. If you want peace which passes to all understanding, then you need to come to Jesus. In Jesus you'll find salvation which will bring you peace with God and that will bring you the rest that you so desperately desire. The world is tired out there. Did you know that? Oh yes, they run to and fro and they party here and there and they do this and that. But they're tired. They need rest. But they haven't come to the one who can give them rest. Won't you come to Jesus now before it's eternally too late? Can you imagine going through a whole eternity without rest? No peace with God? Separated forever. There's only one door. That's Jesus. And He bids you come. You have to make a decision as I pray. Now, Heavenly Father, You gave us a lot to think about today. How we need to wait on You and to watch to pray without ceasing. To find peace and rest, we must have Jesus. I pray, Lord, if there's any here today that don't have that rest, that peace, that today would be that day that they would come and say, I want to be saved. I want to find peace and I want to rest. Lord, we're sinners. Even though we've been washed clean by the blood of Jesus, we're still sinners. And we have no idea of the pain and anguish of our Savior as He took our sins upon Him. But one day we will see Him as He truly is. And what a glorious day that will be, Father, when we're with You forever. But I pray that no one will leave here today until they have made a decision for Jesus. And I know that there are worries and hurts and concerns this morning. And I pray that You're working in every single heart, that Your Holy Spirit is working and calling. We'll give You the honor and the glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Like this evening, if you'll be with us, 6.30, we'll be back in the Lord willing in the book of Romans. We'll be finishing up Romans in a few weeks, Lord willing. And uh, by request of several people who had questions, we're going to go back and do a study that we did probably 10 or 11 years ago, maybe more. We're going to study on the Antichrist following Romans. So be with us tonight at 6.30. Wednesday we meet at 5.30, a little earlier. So be with us. Join us if you can. I'm sure that you'll receive a blessing.